to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ charm is deceitful and beauty is passing but a woman who fears the lord she shall be praised proverbs chapter 31 verse number 30. welcome to our study of godly homes in an ungodly world as always today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the church of christ in your area we'd love for you to stop by and visit the local church of christ in your area where you'll find people who love the word of god and are indeed concerned about souls if you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons on the godly home you can contact us at the information found at the end of this broadcast or you can visit our website thegospelofchrist.com where you'll find a host of Bible study materials on a variety of subjects, all of which are provided free of charge. If you'd like to have a DVD or a CD, or you can view that on your iPad or computer, we'd love for you to locate us on the website and there view our material. And if you have a Bible question, we're concerned about souls as well. If you've got a Bible question, please don't hesitate to write to us. We'd love to hear back from you about those questions also. As we think about the godly home, each person in the home plays such an important role in the home being what God wants it to be. For example, we noticed last time that the husband was to be the head of the home, the spiritual leader, and that he sets the direction spiritually for the home. In complement to that, today we think about the godly wife and mother. The Bible identifies her as such a valuable asset in the home. The proverb writer says in Proverbs 31 verse 10, Who can find a virtuous wife? She is more precious, her value is more precious than rubies than the finest gem in the world, the godly wife. She is more important and more valuable than those gems could ever be to the home. And so as we think about this godly wife, as we think about her role in the home, let's realize first this is indeed a position of honor. It's worthy of respect and reverence and honor by all who are in the home. For example, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 7, the Bible says, Husbands are to give honor to their wives as to the weaker vessel. If you honor something, what do you do with that? Well, if you have something that is really valuable, very important, or very special to you, and you want to honor that, you might put it on a pedestal. You might place it where it can be seen and keep it in a way that it will be taken care of. The wife is to be given honor by the husband. He is to recognize her importance. He is to praise her for her value, and she is to be treated with respect by all who are in the home. Uh, this position of honor is also seen in Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 22. The proverb writer says, He who finds a wife, finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. She's viewed as something from on high. She's viewed as a, a gift from God, reminding us all the way back to creation. Genesis 2 verse 18, The Lord God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. Well, what did God do then? He made man a helper comparable from him, comparable to him. God took a rib out of man and made woman and brought it to him and said, Adam said, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. And so the man who finds a good wife, he finds a good thing and he needs to respect and honor her 
for that in each and every way. In fact, the Bible will say in Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 14, this concerning the value of a godly wife. Listen to these words. Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. You know, when we think about the godly wife and that position of honor, let's do what we can in the home to let her know how important she is. Both husband and children alike need to recognize that without the mother in the home, it would be greatly lacking in so many areas. But you know, not only is the godly wife a position of honor in the Bible, it is seen as a position of submission to the husband. Now, as we think about submission, I understand that in our day and age today, many don't like that idea, and it may be because they have a misunderstanding of what submission really is. Please understand that when we mention submission, we're not talking about inferiority. We're not talking about the wife being of no value. We've already mentioned that she is. We're talking about the hierarchy that God set up in the home and how the wife has the responsibility to be in submission to her husband. Listen to Ephesians 5, verse 22 through 24. The Scripture says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. What's the, the model and the background for submission? The church is in submission to Christ. He is the head, the church is the body, we're in submission to Him so also wives ought to be in submission to their husbands. How's that a fair parallel? Well, here's how. Christ serves as the perfect head. He gave Himself for the church. He looks out for the church's best interest. Everything He did was for the saved in the church. He's not selfish. He's not self-glorifying. He is selfless in that area. When the wife is to be in submission to the husband, just as the church is to Christ, the husband has to be the background for her doing that. His actions must be selfless, not self-glorifying. He's not a glorified dictator. He's not looked at himself as a boss to boss everybody around. Rather, what he does is in the best interest of everybody in the home. He's not forcing people. He's not making people. He's being the spiritual leader he ought to be. And when those characteristics exist, it's not hard for a wife to be in submission to someone who's in submission to God themselves. What is this position of submission related to, and, and are there any barriers to that, guidelines for it? Sure there are. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 says, Husbands are to be, or wives are to be in submission to their husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. What does that little phrase, as is fitting in the Lord, mean? Well, naturally, if the husband is being the godly leader, following the scriptures, trying to guide everybody in the right path spiritually, the wife will naturally want to follow that. But the moment he stops following Christ, the moment he starts doing things or requesting things or wanting things for the family that are immoral, that are ungodly, that are unethical, and that are contrary to scripture, a wife can't submit to that. For example, if a husband and wife ran a business, and he being the head of that home and the head of that business, asked his wife to do something unethical, whether cheat on the taxes, lie to customers, whatever it may be, because she's in submission to the husband, does that mean she has to follow him in sin? Of course not. As is fitting in the Lord, as is in compliance with the teaching of Christ, as he is following the teaching of God, she is absolutely bound by God to submit to him. But in things that are immoral or unethical, she's not to follow his leadership if his leadership is not indeed following the teaching of Christ. What else does it mean for wives to be in submission? Titus chapter 2 verse number 5 tells us that wives 
are to be obedient to their own husbands. Is there a sense in which she has the responsibility to obey him? Just as Sarah did Abraham. In 1 Peter 3 verses 5 through 7, Titus 2 5 says, Wives are to be obedient to their own husbands. In what sense? In the sense that he's a dictator? Again, that's not the idea. But rather as he is striving to lead this family in a godly direction, as he's striving to help people grow spiritually, to set guidelines for discipline, to set guidelines, godly guidelines for the home, to help people grow spiritually, she is to submit to and be obedience in obedience to those practical principles that he sets up. But again, this is not something that would be hard. If the man is really doing what God wants him to do, He's already in obedience to God. As a godly husband, he must live in obedience to the will of God. And as he lives in obedience to the will of God, the wife is to be obedient to her own husband. Now, what about a scenario that is a mixed marriage? A husband who's not a Christian and a wife who is a Christian. Are there any guidelines or boundaries in such a situation as that? There absolutely are, and we want you to hear what Peter has to say, beginning in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. How does a wife remain that, keep that submission, strive to fulfill her role in a scenario where the husband may not be a Christian or a faithful Christian? Look in, listen to 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse number 1. Wives, Likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. What do we know about the relationship in maybe a marriage where one husband, the husband is not a Christian, the wife is, she's still to try as best possible to remain in submission to Him. Don't let it be the outward that is attractive. Oh, that's attractive. We know that. But what is it that will really draw this man to Christ? Her inward beauty, her submission, her willingness to follow his leadership as much as she can and to be in submission to him shows she's trying to follow the Bible even though he may not. And so how's he going to be one without a word to the Lord? Through her powerful example. Does that mean we shouldn't talk to him? Not at all. Wives ought to try to encourage their husbands. Wives ought to open doors where he can learn the gospel as well. But when all else isn't working, her example, her submission, her faithfulness to the Lord and the consistency of her faithfulness to Jesus no matter what will reach that man's heart that may not be reached by anything else. What else do we know about the wife as the godly role model and godly mother? In the scripture, she is also seen as a homemaker or keeper of the home. Titus chapter 2 verse 5 mentions that wives are to be keepers of the home. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 14, as well as Proverbs 31, verses 27 through 29, teach this idea as well. Are we saying that in being a keeper of the home, the wife can't have any kind of work outside the home? I don't think you find that in Scripture for both Lydia in Acts chapter 16 and the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31 both had some kind of labor and venture both inside and outside of the home. And so I don't think when we say homemaker or keeper of the home, that means you have to stay in the house no matter what. That's not the idea. Let's parallel it this way. What is the church? Is the church the building? 
No, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Acts chapter 7, verses 48 through 50. What's the church? The church is the people. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 20 through 27, the writer says, You are the body of Christ and members individually, one of another. And so, if the church is not the building, it's the people, what's the home? The home is not the house, the dwelling per se. It does include that, but it's not contained to that only. When we talk about the wife being keeper of the home, what's her responsibility as a homemaker? To take care of everybody in the home. Just as the church is the people, is the members, the home is everybody in the home. Husband, children, uh, if there are widows who must be taken care of as well in the home, whether it be a mother-in-law or a mother, that would be inclusive as well. The members inside the home is her responsibility. And so when we talk about the wife being a godly mother, a godly wife, we're talking about somebody, listen carefully, whose first and main priority are the members in that home. Would that include things like keeping the home taken care of, keeping the house taken care of, feeding, clothing? Sure, it would be inclusive of that, but she's not the only one who can do that as well, although that would fall under her guideline. But more importantly than that, she supplements the family in such a way that her first interest is to make sure that everyone in the home is provided for in a way that only she can do. Nurturing, loving, caring, tender, in a, in a providing way. That is the way that she takes care of the home as a homemaker. And so when we hear that word homemaker, let's realize that the family must be first. That's the priority that's being mentioned in Titus chapter 2, verse number 5 as well. Let's then think about another quality of a godly wife and godly mother. The scripture identifies her position as a position of love. I want you to hear what Paul will say to the young evangelist Titus as he thinks about especially younger mothers and their relationship and role in the home being that of love. Listen to Titus chapter 2 beginning in verse number 4. The Bible says that the older women are to admonish the younger women, listen now, to love their husbands, to love their children. What kind of position is hers? It's a position of love. Anybody will tell you. No one has the ability to love like a mother or a wife. There's just something special or unique about that. And the older women are to be the example to the younger women, teaching them, here's your first and main priority. Love your husband, love your children. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 7 illustrates that uh, just as a nurturing mother loves and cares for her children and her husband, the husband and children should come first. Other things must not be as important as them. And so, with this godly wife and godly mother, there is the position of love. She is to be the expression of and the recipient of love in her family. How does she do that? By her many actions. Look at how she's the keeper of the home, what she's doing for the family in providing, caring, taking care of, making sure everybody's fed and clothed and, and dressed nicely and all the things that would go along with that. And then not just that, but hers is a position of in her tenderness that only a mother or wife can give, in her care that she so, so graciously provides, and that ought to be reciprocated back to her just as well in her position. Now, as we think about the responsibility and role of the godly wife, let's also realize she is to respect her husband. We've already mentioned, according to 1 Peter 3 verse 7, that husbands are to honor and respect their wives. Now, the wife is also to respect her husband. Notice Ephesians 5 verse number 33. The scripture says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she reverences or respects her husband. In the hierarchy of the home, 
If the wife doesn't respect the husband, the children... And the family won't respect him as well. Now, that goes both ways. If the husband doesn't, husband doesn't respect the wife, the children won't respect her either. But we need to set the tone of respect. We recognize, and we do that not, not because that person necessarily is inherently valuable of that. No, worthy of that. Rather, we do that because that's what God says. May they be worthy of it? Absolutely. But more importantly than that, it is a position of respect because God says so. We respect God. We respect Jesus Christ. We respect the breakdown of the home. And God has told husbands and wives to respect and honor one another. Listen to another passage. It mentions how wives are to respect their husbands. We mentioned it a while ago, but notice 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The Scripture says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. When we think about the responsibility that a wife may have, especially when there's a husband who hasn't obeyed the gospel, really isn't too keen on hearing that, what can she do? Let her role be accompanied by fear and respect as best as possible, as he's following, as is fitting in the Lord, as he's following the guidelines found in the Bible, respect and honor him. And that will have the ability, as much as anything else, to soften his heart towards her, knowing that she's doing that because of what the Scriptures and God sets in order. Another principle that relates to both husband and wives, but we mention it here because the proverb writer mentions this in relation to the wife, is that husbands and wives must not nag one another. I want you to listen to these passages in the book of Proverbs that, that addresses the idea of not, not badgering, not Heckling, if we can use that word, not nagging one another. Listen to Proverbs chapter 21 and notice what the Scripture says in verse number 9. The Bible says, Better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Again, we recognize this could go either way, but look at the extreme setting. The proverb writer sets here for us, it's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop, not just on the housetop, not just on the roof, but better to dwell in the corner of the roof, the farthest position you could get away, than to live in the house with a contentious wife. Contentious wife. Now again, could go both ways, but the principle is this, nobody wants to live near, be around, and enjoy the companionship of someone who is contentious, fighting, nagging, bickering all the time. Those are not things you need in the home. That won't foster good relationships. Now, listen to another passage. Proverbs chapter 25, verse number 24 says it again. It is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious wife. Notice Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 4. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness to the bones. The one who would nag, belittle, make fun of, live her character in contradiction to the teaching of Christ and bring shame to the husband, that's not something we want to see among God's people or in the home as God would set it. And so as we think about godly character, as we think about things that Christ sets up for the home, we want to think about real women of godly character and what that means. Let me give you an example from Scripture. If we were to define women of godly character based on a, a few descriptions in Scripture, it'd be hard to improve upon the words of Titus chapter 2 verses 3 through 5. Here is that godly character. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers 
of good things. That they admonished the younger women to love their husbands, love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands. Why? That the Word of God may not be blasphemed. In a day and age where feminism has run rampant in our society, where the, the mantra and the idea is that the woman needs to be the out-of-home professional and her job needs to be first, you know, friends, we simply need to go back to what the Bible says. We're not saying it's wrong for a woman to have a job outside the home, but her first priority set by God is to be the one who takes care of, provide, love, nurture, and care for all in the home. She is such a fundamental and foundational piece of that home that just like if the husband is not the head of the home, if the wife is not the keeper of the home, that home is on the very verge of ruin and destruction. What do we need today to really have godly homes in an ungodly world? We simply need husbands and fathers, mothers and wives who will put their role in the family above their career, their recreation, or any other priority they may have in this life. Your main responsibility, my main responsibility as a husband or a wife, as a father or mother, is to help the person in my home or the people in my home get to heaven. I want to make sure that I can do what I can to provide an environment where spiritual growth, where communication, where love, and where Christ is the center of that home, where the wife and the children can have every opportunity available to grow, to prosper, and to transform themselves every day into the image of Christ. Friend, nothing greater could be done for the home than for husbands and wives to take their responsibility seriously and to strive to be what Christ wants them to be, godly fathers, godly mothers, godly husbands and wives in a godly home. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.